Hello, and welcome to the CNS Symposium on the Affective Neuroscience of Socioeconomic Status. SES is a ubiquitous dimension of human variation. Wherever you go, you see people who are better off and worse off in terms of material resources and uh, social resources like education, um, uh, job status, and so forth. Now, um, this is just a reminder. Uh, we, we pass uh, people poor and rich on the street in our communities all the time. This demographic dimension has only begun to be explored in terms of brain function. Um, Interestingly, other uh, demographic variations like age or sex and or gender, um, we know more about. Um, but in recent years, we have uh, learned that like these other important dimensions of variation, SES is associated with all kinds of important psychological outcomes. And indeed, low levels of SES are associated with problems and suffering. Um, so trying to understand how that comes to be uh, could have important societal benefits. Now, the probably the best uh, known uh, psychology SES relations, at least in the cognitive neuroscience world, are the relations that SES has to cognition. Um, for example, uh, your childhood family income has, as you see here, a fairly steep gradient uh, in its relation to young adult IQ. You know, well over a a uh, standard deviation of IQ difference um, for going from, uh, um, you know, minimum wage to uh, professional salaries. Another illustration of this, just to convince you that this is, you know, th these are not um, kind of arcane little uh, differences between people, but differences that really make a difference in your life. Um, these are data from ETS, the people who make the SAT, showing the gradient in SAT scores as a function of income. And here again, you know, over 150 points of difference um, on, on the SAT associated with one end to the other end of uh, income. What's gotten less attention is the relation of SES to affective well-being. But let me show you that these relations are just as strong and therefore just as uh, important to understand. This is a graph of um, the percentage of people who in the last year have met uh, you know, the criteria for major depressive disorder. Um, this is uh, based on a survey done in Ontario, Canada. And what you can see is that a rather shocking 14% of people in the lowest 10th um, decile of income have symptoms of depression. Whereas um, it's, uh, it's well less than half of that, really more like a third of that um, in the top income decile. Another illustration also from Canadian um, uh, government uh, records is the relation of mental health related disability. That is people who have such uh, mental health problems that they can't work um, as a function of level of education. Level of education um, is one of those uh, social resources that um, is fairly correlated with um, 
material resources. And as you can see, it's almost, you're almost twice as likely to be mentally disabled if you have less than a high school education than if you've gone beyond high school in your education. Finally, there's, there's another factor here, um, physical health, which is, it, it turns out to be interrelated, as you will see in the coming talks, with um, these other psychological outcomes. Um, and there are steep gradients in, um, in physical health, in uh, longevity, also as a function of SES. Let me just point out that these um, different uh, traits are highly interconnected. They influence each other. There's a web of um, mutual influence that also is related to socioeconomic status. So as you'll see, um, physical uh, measures of physical health, immune system response, uh, has an impact on, for example, affective well-being. Today's talks are going to um, cover the relation between SES and um, these cognitive, affective, physical health uh, parameters at four different stages of life. As a fetus, as a child, as a young adult, and as a parent. Um, the, just to preview some of the um, uh, themes, topics that will come up in these different talks, um, we will uh, see the anatomy of um, affect uh, come up in, I think, all of the talks. That is, the, you know, brain activity related to threat, you know, most notably the amygdala, brain activity related to reward, most notably the ventral striatum. Um, sadly, rule of thumb uh, so far in this literature is that a uh, low SES is related to greater threat reactivity, but blunted reward response. It's kind of a sad way to go through life. Um, and also our speakers will be talking about the connectivity of these areas and others to likely regulatory regions. The um, relevance of these brain differences will be in most cases related to behavioral measures um, of well-being because ultimately we're interested in the brain because it can explain stuff about people's lives. So for example, in the first talk, you will see um, relations between brain connectivity and uh, child behavior, child adjustment. And the speakers will be covering the neural correlates of SES as a cause of these differences or as a consequence. And obviously, questions of Causality are very um, hard to uh, address in uh, most human studies, but um, we'll, uh, we'll get as close as we can. Um, our second speaker will refer to some animal studies that give us better purchase on that. And finally, I just want to flag three factors that we will see frequently in these different talks. Um, and you see them frequently in studies of SES and mental health in general, parenting, inflammation, and stress. And these, again, are interconnected by a web of mutual influence. For example, um, if you're highly stressed, it's harder to be a good parent, or you, it certainly changes your, your um, approach to parenting. Our speakers, uh, whom I will now introduce, are in order Mariah Thomason from the NYU Langone uh, Medical School in New York, Joan Luby 
from Washington University in uh, St. Louis, Robin Nusslock from Northwestern University in Chicago, and Pilyoung Kim from the University of Denver in Denver. <laughs> so uh, without further ado, I am very pleased to uh, hand over the screen um, to our speakers. Thank you.